Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, part one of a trip to the blacksmith shop. How do you turn this into this? Taking a round chunk of steel, applying heat and hammering, and I end up with this hatchet that just is what totally enthuses me about blacksmithing. Then, Lake Superior water levels could reach a record high in 2018. We'll talk about the possible impacts. That's all tonight, right here on Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of Northern Michigan. In a time long ago, the blacksmith was at the heart of every village and was often thought of as a magician because of his mastery of ironworking and ability to understand the metallurgy of the iron that he used. Those days may be long gone, but the blacksmith still does exist. In Marquette, that's Gordon Gearhart. Well, my name is Gordon Gearhart and I'm a blacksmith living and working in Marquette. I started blacksmithing in 1981 uh, and have kept at it since. I met Gordon a while back at the infamous Margie Gessick bike race. Gordon is the creator of the coveted buckles given out to only a select few. This time I was in his shop to watch as he transformed a regular hunk of metal into something unique and useful. I'm going to make a hatchet today. Uh, I'm using a torsion bar from some kind of American made pickup truck. I will cut a section of this and uh, form the material that I will use to make the hatchet. The fuel I burn in my forge is uh, called coke. It's coal that's been refined in a burning process. The first thing I'm gonna do is cut this bar off to the length that will make the material that I need to make the hatchet head. So my first step will be to bring it over here to the anvil cut some marks with that tool which is called a hot cut. Then I'll take it to the power hammer and cut it all the way off. Making short ones out of long ones. And so what I'm doing here is just filing off the ragged ends of the cut so that they do not get forged into the final piece. The next step with this, we'll, I'll put it on end under the power hammer and make it short and square it up. I, I salvage a lot of my own steel, uh, and it rarely is the proper size that I need, so I end up hammering it down into the size I need. Uh, the hatchet head's a, an example of this, where I'm starting with a round bar, and in the process of forging, we'll turn it into a rectangular block, uh, which will then be made into the hatchet.
I have made a lot of my own tools. A few of the hammers I've made, many of them I've collected from garage sales and junk shops. Uh, the tongs and the chisels and punches, uh, all of those I've made. You know, through the years, I've made special tools for particular jobs. Sometimes they only have one use, and uh, then they are used for that job and then not used again. A lot of times I'll reconfigure them to work for something else. Bring the block out of the fire. I'm just gonna put some light marks in here. This will be where the eye starts. The goal is to have the two cuts meet directly at the same point in the center of the bar. Sometimes it happens, sometimes not. <laughs> A little coal dust in there to keep a chisel from sticking. I guess blacksmithing goes in spurts. Uh, there's a lot of action for a very short time and then there's a lot of standing around waiting for it to get hot again. Little bits at a time. Started out working sheet metal. Uh, I, I worked for my grandfather during my summers when I was in high school. I guess that's what got me to be pounding on metal. It wasn't blacksmithing, but it was still related to you know, hammers and metal, and shaping metal with hammers. The blacksmithing came about through an interest in making knives. And my idea of making knives came from a book that I had that gave a description on how to make a knife. It involved uh, a forge and hammering. So that really got me started thinking about blacksmithing. So the next step in this process is to open that hole up a little bit, drive a series of drifts through there to shape that eye. Eventually I got enough information in my head that I uh, built a forge and acquired some coal and an anvil and a hammer. And uh, that was really the beginning of my blacksmithing. I had very little knowledge about uh, blacksmithing itself, but through books and trial and error, I learned. Why I keep doing it, the uh, process of heating metal and then pushing it into shape with hammers and other tools is really what, what has kept me doing it. You know, there's an endless variety of shapes that can be created with that uh, method. Uh, and I keep coming up with things that interest me in that, that area. So there we go. The hole is slit through the bar. I could make this all with hand hammer, but uh, I think I'll use the power. A fair amount of my work is custom order. I do production items that I take to uh, various sales and demonstrations that I do, but most of my work is custom order. Some of it's inspired by my customers who uh, want a specific style or a specific uh, motif in their work that they're ordering. Uh, I recently did a fire screen and I followed my customer's uh, business logo, which was uh, tree branch with birds. And so using that as a takeoff point, I came up with my own interpretation. Uh, sometimes I'll just have ideas in my head and think that I need to carry them out. <laughs> that, that would apply to a lot of my artwork. Blacksmith's fire burns hot because of the air that is going into it, and uh, there's various ways of getting that air there. It could be done with a hand-operated bellows system, or as time uh, 
or technology progressed. Uh, there was uh, hand crank blowers, or basically was a hand operated fan. Uh, and what I use here now is uh, an electric fan that blows the air into the fire. It saves a lot of uh, effort and energy expenditure. And while the fan is blowing, I can be doing other things. Historically speaking, I mean, Marquette was all about production of iron and uh, forging iron into bars to be used in the various industries that were going on in the UP, uh, the mining, the lumber, probably the fishing industry, you know, the iron that went into ships and keeping them floating. And, you know, Marquette was a city that was uh, built on, on providing that iron for all those industries that were happening up here in the late 1800s. You know, it's kind of ironic or maybe fitting that I am here in Marquette um, hammering iron. That's starting to look like a hatchet now. Just going to refine the edge a little bit, call it done. I could leave out a whole lot of steps in this process and come up with a usable and functional hatchet. But I do like to take it a step further and really refine the, the looks of the piece and uh, ultimately how it hangs on the handle and how it's used. So I make axes uh, for the satisfaction of making an axe. I could go to the store, buy an axe, but that uh, would not be the same as taking the time and learning the skills to actually make one. I'm gonna grind the uh, profile of this head and then uh, do a little more hammering and then harden and temper. Now, why should somebody buy one of my axes? Well, because I made it here. Uh, they could come and they could talk to me. They could see the process. Um, that's the difference between buying one of my axes that has my logo stamped in it, as opposed to going to the store and buying one made somewhere else. A well-made tool works well, and uh, a, a poorly made tool doesn't work so well. It keeps me creative, keeps me interested in working and making stuff. Uh, taking a round chunk of steel, applying heat and hammering, and I end up with this hatchet that just is what totally enthuses me about blacksmithing and uh, keeps my interest going because I could do this uh, every day for the rest of my life. Be sure to tune in next week for part two of our trip to the blacksmith shop. The Great Lakes in general had a significant period of lake water levels being well below average in the mid-1990s until about five years ago. Now, water levels are higher than many people have seen in their lifetime. Lake Superior water levels are on track to set a new record high in 2018. How? 
Why and what impact might that have on fishing and shoreline residents? Yeah, the Lake Superior water levels are up because uh, we've had increased uh, precipitation and uh, a lot of the precipitation, of course, we see over the summer months when we get these heavy rains. And then also in the winter months is what really increases it when we get system snows. And these are snows that come in from the west. Uh, a lot of people in uh, Lake Superior are accustomed to our famous lake effect snows, but th that's not system snow. We actually lose that water out of the basin in many areas because when you get uh, lake effect snow, uh, some of the areas, if you get down by Munising, Wetmore, in the Sini stretch where all those rivers are, that snow actually leaves once it deposits down there in the lake effect. So when you get these big storms coming in from the west that carry a lot of moisture, that's what helps increase the water levels into the lake. Uh, when the spring comes, uh, all this snowpack. And, uh, and what they do, even this time of year in the spring, early spring when the snowpacks are, they actually do measurements, they do flyovers, and they get an estimate of the snowpack, so they get ready for, on these projections, so when they start projecting where the lake levels are gonna go on Lake Superior. And for this spring right now, because we're probably a couple inches off uh, the record again, is when we get the spring rains along with all the snow melt, uh, we could actually touch or or break the record like coming into May, June, and July. So it's a real possibility right now. Back in 2006, 2007, we had very, very low water levels. And again, we touched the record back in 2007. And many of the boaters probably remember how difficult it was to access a lot of the boat landings. So that's a problem. Now we're on the other side of it. We've got plenty of water to land boats, but but it hurts the property owners, like a lot of the properties that are on the Great Lakes, especially on Lake Superior, uh, you get a lot of damage into these areas right now because with these wind events, uh, we get these big waves coming into the shoreline and it really creates a lot of property damage. Uh, when we had the record levels back in 1986, Grand Marais, Michigan lost its uh, park down there because of the high water levels and we're gonna, it looks like we're gonna get there again the way things are projected right now. If you look at the water levels on the Great Lakes, there, there's a lot of areas. There are some fish in the Great Lakes that rely on wetland areas. If you look at some of the, you know, some of the cool water species like walleye, pike, stuff like that, perch. So when you get water levels that go up and down, it actually replenishes some of the nutrients. Like uh, the water levels go down, there's a lot of plant growth in there. Then when the water levels come back up, you know, there's a lot of uh, disturbance and stuff like that. So a lot of the nutrients are uh, put back into the system. So a lot of these different cycles that we have actually can have positive effects on the fish, and especially in these wetland areas where they reproduce. So it actually uh, keeps the nutrient cycle going and you know, increases the food chain for the larval fish to eat. What we've seen is seasonal cycles. I mean, in the spring, when the snow melt happens, when the spring rains come, the lakes, within a year, they go up and up and down. In the spring, they start going up into early summer. Then over the summer, if it gets drier, they go back down towards fall. If you get a lot of evaporation, like if you get winters where there's no ice, open waters, people don't realize the evaporation you can get off the lake. It's like the lake's boiling. You see that steam coming off the lake. We, lo we lose just millions and millions of gallons a second off the lake when that occurs. Again, they cycle back and forth. And these are long-term cycles we're into right now where over the last you know, several years, we've had more precipitation into the basin. So it's had a chance to build up these water levels. Several years back, we had the polar vortexes, a couple of real severe winters where it really capped the water off with, with the ice where Lake Superior actually froze right over. And so we didn't get a lot of this evaporation off the lake, so that water was actually preserved in the system. So that's why we're dealing with these high water levels right now. Right now, actually, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, which are virtually one lake, they're actually connected at the strait, so geologically they're, they're one lake, so the levels are the same, is uh, still those lakes aren't, aren't near the record uh, highs yet. They're still below it. So Lake Superior is the one that's skirting these, the record right now. So, but again, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are very high. Uh, I've done some work down there with some water rescue stations down there where along northern uh, Lake Michigan along US-2 in Mackinac County, and we've had a lot of the rescue stations destroyed down there because they're close to the water line. So they're, they're pretty high yet too, but they're not near the record. If you look at good or bad, you know, for property owners, it's probably bad, you know, in, or even municipalities. I mean, you can look at Marquette, the road that goes along the shore. I mean, there's a lot of damage that occurs. Water gets up on, on these areas where you can get road closure. So 
uh, it creates a lot of problems. So the other thing is too, is if you get certain storm events where you even get seiches that set up on the lake, and this is where the lake actually can tip back and forth. Some of the rivers, even certain times, you might get a lot of water backing up into some of these river systems, which could affect some of the fishing, if you're, especially when you get into the steelhead run, stuff like that. So, so fishermen should be aware of some of these events that could occur with weather events. Sault Ste. Marie, we have 16 compensating gates that, uh, where the outflow is, plus we have three power plants over in that area. And right now, the power plants over in the Sault Ste. Marie on both sides, uh, U.S. and Canada, they're at full max right now, and they've been ordered to be at full max to get as much water out of the lake as we can. But at this time of the year, what we have going on in Lake Superior is we have, uh, uh, there's 100 uh, cubic feet per second in excess leaving the lake over above the average, but that's a lot of water. But right now with the ice that's still there over by these compensating gates, they can't let any more water out. But later in the year, they'll probably shoot to let a lot more water out of the lake. But again, Lake Superior is such a large volume of, of water. I mean, you can fit all the lower uh, Great Lakes into Lake Superior and have even room for another Lake Erie. So that's how much water we have in it. You could flood actually the United States with Lake Superior by about five foot of water, maybe up to seven feet. So that's how big this lake is. And then we also have in Lake Superior, we have a couple diversions on the north side of Lake Superior, the Long Lake and Agoki diversions. Uh, uh, these diversions are up in Canada, and the water would actually go up to Hudson Bay, Canada, but it's diverted back into Lake Superior. And you get about 6,500 uh, cubic meters per second that's diverted into Lake Superior that we wouldn't ordinarily have. And that's been going on for many years. I mean, it's nothing new. And that probably adds maybe another two to three inches to the water levels uh, that we see in Lake Superior. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovery.